Hi, I'm Howard Burton. I'm an author and documentary filmmaker, and welcome to the Rogue Monkey podcast. This week, we are on the move as we speak to an inspiring Canadian who resides in France. Howard is the author of six books and the co-founder of the award-winning multimedia initiative Ideas Roadshow. He is the creator and director of a brand new four-part series, Through the Mirror of Chess, a cultural exploration, which examines the remarkable impact of chess on culture, art, science and sport. Now I want to give some context to the scale and reach that the game of chess has around the world. Around 250 million people play football globally. When it comes to chess, that number is more than 600 million people. The history of the game is intertwined with so many aspects of human history and culture. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I really hope you do too. So let's get straight into it and episode 89 of the Rogue Monkey podcast featuring author and filmmaker Howard Burton. Hello, Howard, and welcome to the podcast. How are we doing? I'm doing very well. Thanks very much for having me. Oh, thank you for agreeing to share some time with us. You've got a fascinating story and wear quite a few hats. So I'd be keen to, for our listeners and viewers' benefit just to give us a bit of an introduction as to who you are and a bit about your story. Great. Um, so I am a Canadian by, by birth and by uh, the first few decades of my life. Um, I grew up in Toronto, which is a bit of a confusing uh, tip right there, because if you have any listeners who are from Toronto, you're supposed to say Toronto and not or Toronto and not Toronto. But anyway, that's a minor point. Um, and uh, I have a um, uh, an academic background. Um, I have a, a PhD in, in physics and um and also a, a master's degree in philosophy and by a curious concatenation of events i wound up uh building and running a, a theoretical physics institute in a place called waterloo ontario just about an hour west of toronto uh for the better part of a decade or so eight years or something like that and then i i moved to france and by another curious stream of events that i'm not quite sure I understand. I eventually found myself um, moving into digital media and and um, founding an initiative called Ideas Roadshow that started off, uh, this was about 10 years ago, and started off as a way of conveying research ideas to a broad general public, having a lot of filmed conversations with people and, uh, and developing a suite of products, video and, and in print, uh, that accompany that with the idea of doing something a little bit different, getting behind the scenes to the extent that we could really talk about the issues, what was motivating people, what was frustrating them, not, not terribly dissimilar to, in fact, what you're doing, um, really trying to understand what was driving people in their research and also trying to make their research as broadly accessible as possible, moving beyond a lot of cliches. Um, and at that point, I had had no experience whatsoever in digital media. And then after having done that for a while and moving, developing a whole bunch of educational products, I naturally became uh, knowledgeable about uh, filming. And so from there, it was a fairly, um, I think, logical progression into starting to make films. And so now I find myself a filmmaker so all sorts of odd things happen to you if you if you wait long enough i suppose yeah i mean there's about 15 different avenues i'd be keen to explore there and i think one of the things that you've already alluded to is this this lineage i guess between storytelling and accessibility because i think often especially in the academic world the veneer if you like of some of the real technical jargon and things like that and the way that certainly academic papers of wrote can make sometimes really profound ideas extremely inaccessible so that kind of routing of storytelling where did that come from because that generally is something that i think people don't just suddenly turn to it's something they generally have more of a passion for so i'd be keen to kind of find out where that developed i think that's right um i i i'm hesitating because i i think that's right but i, I think m many people maybe even most of us 
are really interested in stories. Um, I mean, that's part of being human, whether you want to create them, whether you want, want to listen to them and so forth. And I, I think one of the things that has long irritated me, I'm fairly easily irritated. So, I mean, that's a large category of things. But one of the things that has irritated me is, is how so many fascinating stories never seem to make it out. And when I, when I was, um, this I think was particularly evident to me when I was running this physics institute, because one of the things that I thought would be really wonderful to do would be to launch uh, a public, a, a very extensive public outreach initiative. It was an, uh, it was an institute that was founded through the, uh, through the through the vision through the orientation of a of a private philanthropist and then through that we got uh the federal government and the provincial government in canada involved as well so it turned out to be a public private partnership but uh the sense was well this was a great uh, opportunity this is a this is a celebration it should be a celebration and as such we should try to develop um a very, uh, we should try to celebrate this by engaging with the public in ways that perhaps hadn't been done quite so well before. And this was something that I thought would be a logical and, and fun thing to do. And in plunging into that world, you, you quickly get a sense that so many things are just not done very well. Um, and there are all sorts of false stereotypes. So for example, there's a sense of academics are these pointy headed intellectuals that don't have the capacity to be able to engage and communicate with ordinary people on their level. Um, and I found that almost exclusively, not always, but almost exclusively to be completely wrong. Uh, it's, that's certainly not true. Um, there are also, and in fact, my, my great conclusion uh, was, which was something that I had always suspected, but I, I certainly became more aware of it, was that a primary reason why there isn't this opportunity for a genuinely interesting flow of information is that there simply wasn't a vehicle for it. There wasn't an, an occasion for it. There wasn't an opportunity for it. So some researcher would win an award or, be, or become newsworthy by some, uh, you know, some crazy standard somewhere and, and some journalists would rush to them and expect them to basically encapsulate their entire life's work in two sound bites or three sentences or what have you and then walk away. Um, and then there were all the popularizers, this whole industry of popularizing, certainly when it comes to science, but not limited to science, that sometimes does a good job, but more often than not does a terrible job in my view. Um, there's also the, these sort of tropes about the, the one genius scientist working in the corner and so forth. And people tend to focus much more on biographical details rather than on the actual ideas. Um, Einstein said something, well, it's not clear if he actually said it because almost everything in the world has been attributed to Einstein at one point or another, but, uh, Einstein was reputed to have said, and he might've even said this, that, um, if, if you can understand something very well, you should be able to explain it to your grandmother, which some people have interpreted as a as an anti-grandmother sentiment, but that's not the way that, 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 that I have. Uh, the basic idea is that obviously that if you, if you can really understand something, you should be able to understand its core. And as any, any teacher who has taught a general course knows, it's actually a very enlightening and personally, um, uh, personally worthwhile experience to teach a general level course because it forces you to really understand what you know and what you don't know and to be able to express it in a way which uh, really highlights the essential aspects that often get elided through jargon or through assumptions and so forth and so on. So it's in that spirit that I thought it would be really fun and important to um, to try to address that within the context of research ideas. And there are so many fascinating research ideas and almost none of them ever bubble up to the surface to people who aren't in that community. So uh, looking back, I'm not entirely certain I've actually answered your question, but, uh, but there we are. I'm, I'm, I'm done talking now. <laughs> I think the, 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 the academic space is such an interesting one because a lot of what goes on in, in wider society, we would hope is founded in evidence uh, that is accomplished through hopefully rigorous process. But if you look at the actual as assess accessibility of it, it's the ability for people to conceptualize stuff um, from both sides, the people explaining it, but also the people receiving that information. Can they grasp the concepts that we're talking about? And I think 
the podcasting space, the storytelling space, the short stories, different forms of conferences. And I think the the whole space of sharing information, the round the campfire, if you like, has certainly evolved a lot over the last few hundred years. And I think when did you go from, I guess, the idea in your mind of turning it from something in your mind into a, a, a roadshow where you actually went, right, let's let's put this together, let's start delivering this. And what was what was that first leap like to go from idea to actual action? Um I guess the timing was, uh, so after I did this, was involved in this physics institute for eight years or so, then I moved to France and did a few other things. And I started, um, I started a few years after that. Uh, and, and, and like, I think a lot of people who start initiatives, you have no idea. I seem to be always starting initiatives and having no idea what I'm doing. That seems to be sort of a, a very rough encapsulation of my life. Um, and I, I guess some people are comfortable with that and some people are not very comfortable with that. And I'm somebody who's comfortable with that, I suppose. I mean, it's not that I relish being in a situation where I have no idea what I'm doing, but, uh, but it doesn't particularly bother me. And I'd much prefer being in that sort of situation than being in a situation where everything is scripted and ordained and you're fit into a little box somewhere. So, um, so, so the idea of sort of jumping in, uh, my thinking was there are all these people who have interesting stories to tell. And there are all these things that would be worthwhile to extract and to be able to find a way to broadcast to other people and let's go and uh let's go and talk to them so that was uh so that that was the beginning of ideas roadshow and then and then part of that was also i guess a business aspect which is i mean you alluded to this as well in terms of the evolution of storytelling oh by the way we're now living in an era where we're capturing these ideas in a, in a high quality way is actually very easy, high quality way, uh, certainly from a technological perspective. I mean, cameras are very cheap. Um, uh, audio equipment is, is very cheap. You can go and you can uh, travel to someone's home or, or their office or what have you, wherever, and you can engage with them and bring some portable lights and bring, bring a few things with you. Um, and in terms of, I mean, what you do with it, of course, is up to you, but in terms of basic production value, you can do things in such a way where you can have very, very high quality production value, production value that would be, you know, equivalent to cinematic 10 years previously at, for, for very little cost. And, and then you can focus on the content. So it was, I, I think that idea of, okay, let's get going, let's take the plunge, the knowledge that a lot of people in my experience who are experts in their field would talk to me because I had that experience, not because I was so experienced or so wonderful or anything like that, but just because academics like anybody else will talk about the research. People like to talk about what value, what is most important to them is obviously you're, you're intimately aware. Uh, and so that wouldn't be a problem. The technology was there and then it was up to me to try to, bottle it and and edit and i had to learn all these other things as i went so that's taken you on quite a journey across a significant range of subjects and how it landed i guess in terms of how how we connected was on the matter of chess and i'm keen to find a figure out from your journey where did that start and what was your before we delve into the documentary and the other bits you've done around it what was your earliest kind of engagement with the subject matter, if you like, of chess? Well, so I'll get there right, right before I do. I'll hopefully make another link. So the all the things I've been talking about hitherto had to do with the vehicle of engaging with people through a conversational format, not dissimilar to what we're doing now. And, 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 and I did some follow-up podcasts and so forth and so on. Working with the digital media and certainly working on the um, on the video side, I started to make as we as we made materials, uh, some of the tailor made on spec and so forth for uh, for various clients. Not only was I doing 
the full conversations, but I was starting to look at bits and pieces. And then I started putting bits and pieces together of different people around different themes. So, oh, these people have talked about the same sort of thing. They have different perspectives. That would be interesting. And you can mix and match. Um, and that led me down from this, this original, I was gonna say mandate, but original inclination or orientation towards long format conversations with people uh, to uh, on a different sort of content level of actually combining different views and producing films. So originally uh, I started thinking about, well, how could I marry those two things within a, a, a filmic setting? And, and that led me towards documentaries that were crafting documentaries that were certainly engaging different people and different perspectives. And for a while, that was the, the new thing. I thought, okay, well, rather than a one long format conversation with people, let's, let's start getting a, a, a panoply of different perspectives and putting them together in an interesting and creative way that, that would be uh, stimulating and interesting for the viewer. Um, and I did a project like that um, about the, the, the pandemic as it happens. Um, so that was my first documentary in that format. It was not uh, super easy to do because there was a pandemic going on. So it was really hard to, uh, to travel around and film people. So I did a lot of the filming remotely, but again, capitalizing on, in fact, I did all of the filming remotely if memory serves, but capitalizing on the skills that I had learned and the interaction. Um, and then I started thinking, and that, that was very interesting, but then I thought, okay, well, what would really be interesting to do again, as I became more aware of the medium is incorporate some, uh, some narrative aspects of storytelling. So it's, it's nice to get this person's perspective and that person's perspective, but, um, it would be, it would be more, perhaps more interesting and more compelling to build a full out product that had that really presented things historically, that told interesting stories, that used visuals, that was really part and parcel of a narrative documentary. And the chess thing uh, struck me as a fantastic example of a way of, of moving into that particular domain and enhancing what I had already done because chess is such um, a remarkably broad topic that touches on so many different areas, has such a, an enormous history, um, and not, not just a long history, not just long in time, but also spatially very diverse. I mean, it, it has affected so many different people in so many places over such a long period of time. And it ha has had such a strong cultural impact. Um, and right to the present day, and it, it, it has so much of, of everything. So it would be a really fascinating topic to be able to to tackle because it can combine this narrative aspect with uh, interview segments and perspectives of people who are involved in various capacities, not just expert chess players, but people who are using chess in terms of social empowerment, in terms of development, in terms of education, in terms of uh, working in prisons, in terms of all sorts of different things. Um, it certainly brings in something that I've become very convinced of uh in the in the since i've worked on this project which is the sporting aspect of chess i don't think when i began this project i looked at chess very much as a sport i think i looked at it uh much more as a game um and i am completely convinced at this point that it is i mean it's not always a sport of course but but it, it has a very very strong sporting and entertainment component to it, which is uh, destined to grow even further. So um, I think that's perhaps a better context to explain my motivation rather than say, when I was seven years old, I was obsessed about chess and I always wanted to do something about chess. I, I Chess has always struck me as a really interesting and intriguing activity because of its so in my mind, because of its uniqueness and over the course of doing this project, I have learned that that is both um, completely accurate and completely inaccurate. It's completely accurate insofar as I think big picture, and we can talk more about that, chess really is phenomenally distinctive and, uh, and its impact is just remarkably unique in so many ways. 
On the other hand, it's not nearly as unique of an activity as I thought it was. And it turns out there is a huge family of chess-like games that I was completely unaware of. And I thought there was one sort of iconic platonic chess thing that people had been doing for 1500 years. And that turns out to be completely wrong. I think there's, you made a really interesting point there about the the lineage and the, and then I guess the viewpoint of it being a sport, because I, even back in my college years, I remember being told the origins of football around kind of mob rules where it was two villages versus each other and getting, I think it was a cow's stomach from kicking it from from one village to another and anyhow it was a timeline mapping that to its present day of saying hey you could go to a three or four or five a side game on the beach in coco cabana you could go and watch the premier league you could go and watch aussie rules football or you could go to different parts of the world i guess and see the different threads but it's that kind of cultural heritage but equally respecting the way it's gone in all the different directions and i think chess is a really interesting one because of the accessibility of it you know it's very you, as, as long as you have your board and your pieces beyond that almost anywhere anytime and now in the modern day with the online accessibility of it it's even more so so when you just settled upon that as something you were you were going to explore what were kind of some of the things and you've alluded to i guess the different aspects of it around the world but what were some of the other aspects of it as of discovery if you like as you were going through this process of oh wow that's interesting oh, i didn't realize that were there ones that stand out to you on that journey in terms of things that i've learned that surprised me uh yeah and, and so forth oh gosh uh lots of things and um maybe that's because i was cycling back to what i said earlier because i didn't know what i was doing and i uh i, I mean at some level, if you're going to plunge into doing something and you're going to do research, tautologically, you're not going to know what you're doing because you're not an expert at it to begin with. So if you're not surprised, then you're doing something incredibly boring because you've already <laughs> figured it out before you actually <laughs> did, did, did the research. Um, but he, there are lots of things that I that I learned that really surprised me. One I, I alluded to just now, which is that there turns out to be lots of chess-like games. I didn't know anything about that. I didn't know... If I knew, it certainly didn't impinge itself on, on my consciousness, the idea of a game like Shogi or Shang-Chi or, or, or Jang-Yi or Makruk. These are all games that are chess like games that are played in, uh, whether it's Japan or China or, or, or Thailand or Korea or what have you. Um, and these aren't, these aren't little things. I mean, Shang-Chi is played by roughly a billion people, if not more. I mean, th th these are... <laughs> <laughs> so, shogi is a big deal if you're in Japan. It's not. It's it's not just some oh those guys play a little bit over there, tiddlywinks or something. It's 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 a very very significant part of their culture, and I knew nothing about that. I knew nothing about how many different types of chess and that the fact that that variation and variability in the game of chess was actually to a large extent, part of its DNA. And I'm talking about sort of Western standard chess has been changed, the number of pieces, the shape of the board, the the all sorts of things have changed and are and are still changing, in fact, in different places. So that was one thing that was a complete surprise to me. I had no I, I suspected that chess had a uh had a, a strong cultural impact, which is as I was saying, a, a motivation for doing the project, but I had no understanding of the extent or and the depths and the and the variety of of that cultural impact so i didn't understand the the uh, i didn't have any sense of how important chess was in medieval literature i didn't have have a sense of how important chess was uh uh, in terms of political allegory, uh, I, I didn't have uh, an understanding of how important chess was uh, in art, uh, the, 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 the metaphorical use and the allegorical use in, in science. I had some sense of artificial intelligence and, and the, the fact that chess played a, a role in computation, but I had no idea of the, the depths uh, of that. Moving to the, to the m more modern era, I guess, so the computation and artificial intelligence obviously is part of the more modern era. Um, this idea of it being a sport and the the extent to which um, it not only it, it it is a sport now, but where it can go and, and part of the modern sporting context. I mean, one of the things that I 
learned because I wasn't involved in that at all, was I started watching chess broadcast live online and the commentators, the, the, the chess commentators, these guys are absolutely amazing. I mean, can you imagine, first of all, a harder sport to be commentating on <laughs> when guys are, 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 to all intents and purposes, to the viewer doing nothing for 45 minutes and then they make a move. I mean, this has got to be one of the hardest things imaginable. And you would think if you didn't know anything about it, there could be nothing more boring than watching chess online. But, but it turns out that that's wrong. These guys do a phenomenal job. Part of that is because they are, uh, they have access to computers now because computers are so good at chess so that they can, uh, they can imagine all sorts of possible things and they can run it through the computer and so forth. Uh, part of it is because of the graphic interfaces, but part of it is because these guys are just amazing at what it is that they're doing. They're, they're, they're able to hold the attention of viewers. They're able to, to, uh, to provide all sorts of, uh, stimulating and illuminating perspectives that give you a sense of what's actually happening. So I I had thought before, gosh, uh, I mean, Julian Barnes has this wonderful uh, expression of, uh, you know, watching, comparing watching uh, chess to, to paint drawing is, is, is unfair to paint, uh, which may have been completely reasonable a few decades ago, but it's certainly not the case now. It's really entertaining. It's, it, it's, it's fascinating. So that whole dimension was surprising, but perhaps the most surprising thing of all was the the social impact of chess. This is something I really had no idea about, that it is used in so many different ways as a phenomenal tool for personal empowerment, uh, particularly for people who are disadvantaged, particularly people who do not have the opportunity to uh, to access whatever, first world facilities or what have you, that they can not only participate and partake of this global culture, but that, that it can do wonders for their confidence and they can use it as a springboard to fully recognizing their capabilities and developing further. And there's a lot of work that's going on in that domain. That's the thing which of all of these things struck me the most. And that's really why I geared the entire film project, which is four films, as you know, to really to, to uh, that's the apex of the journey. That's the culmination is really the social impact over these 1500 years in terms of what chess is doing now. It Again, it sounds ridiculous if you don't know chess can make the world a better place, but but it can. It really can. And it and it is doing that right now. There are so many threads I want to pull off there, so I'm going to try and keep them in order in my mind. You, you touched on the the concept around ai and i think again I, I spend a lot of time listening to podcasts and audiobooks as i'm sure you can imagine and when we talked about accessibility earlier i think this notion of comparing ai to a great chess player and figuring out at what point on computer's progression the computer overcame the human and because i understand chess that gives me a point of relevance, whereas people can talk about processing speed or size of computer or, you know, whatever it is. And sometimes a lot of that goes over our heads. But I think when you can turn around and say somebody who has spent their entire career being devoted to something can be beaten by something that's plugged into a wall. I think that was a really interesting point. And that, that the wider discussion around that is obviously you can get into loads of technical avenues there, but just what it represented in terms of kind of a, a timestamp in the evolution of something other than chess, but chess was used as the vehicle to explain it. I thought was very, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, I think that's absolutely right. And it's not just correct. I think for people who are not specialists in computer science or artificial intelligence or chess or any of that, Everybody needs to, I think, have uh, have examples of what we're talking about so that they can see what the key issues are. And the, the, the principal reason why chess has been used uh, as, as a litmus test of computation, I mean, that, that's not even talk about artificial intelligence uh, at the beginning, just, just the idea of computing something is because on the one hand, it's very easy. And on the other hand, it's very complicated. It's very easy, or at least very clear. 
in the manner uh, in which you described it. You can see if you're winning or you're losing. You can see very clearly if you're performing the task. You can measure the task, how, how much better you're getting or not getting, as the case may be. You can see whether you're succeeding or failing in a way which, again, is, is reminiscent of some aspects uh, uh, of a sporting culture, of a sporting context, right? I mean, you can't, you can't pretend you're either winning or you're losing. You, you, <laughs> you have a clear objective way to be able to determine things. And in the, a lot of problems, you, you don't have that. And it's very constrained in other ways. I mean, it's an activity where you have a set number of pieces that have a set number of moves. They can't go off into, um, uh, all sorts of different directions. They're constrained to move on a, on a two dimensional board and so forth. And I think people don't fully realize how complex human beings are. I mean, what you're doing in your mind when you're crossing the street and you're navigating uh, uh, with different cars and bicycles and what have you that are going at different speeds. I mean, that, that, that actually turns out to be hugely sophisticated if you would model that in you know, partial differential equations or what have you. I mean, it, it's actually, we think it's easy because we do it all the time, but it's really hard. Whereas... Uh, from a mathematical and structural perspective, you you have these pieces, you have them on a board, you you define their movements and so forth, and and in that sense, it's very clear and transparent and straightforward. On the other hand, it's very complicated. One of the things that for a long time was very difficult for people, and why it took so long, in a sense, for computers to get so good at chess, was. Um, the chess positions are hard to evaluate. That's why it's such a rich game. That's why it's so complex. Yeah, you can have the same number of pieces that I have, but they're arranged in a slightly different way and you're in a much better situation than I am. You can have less pieces. You can have less of the good pieces than I than I do, but they've they've been arranged in such a way that they're working together in such a way that they're uh, they're much more powerful. Than, than, than my side happens to be. And of course, part of what makes being a great chess player is being able to appreciate that, being able to predict that, being able to recognize, you know, I can even sacrifice this very strong piece I have and distract my opponent or, or just throw it over here because the pieces that I do have can work synergistically together in such a way that they can they can achieve wonderful things, so they can they can beat my opponent before he can he can do anything. So quantifying that rigorously and scientifically, and saying, okay, well, what does that actually mean, and how do we measure that, and how do we do that, and so forth, that turns out to be phenomenally complicated. Um, and and so chess represents this again. It's 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 wonderful because you can see it, you can test it, you can measure it, you can see is my program doing a good job or a bad job, but at the same time. Uh, it has th this whole treasure trove of different possibilities, and those possibilities themselves, I think, in terms of research, can open up different avenues in in other areas as well. I think, um, again, coming back to kind of conceptualization and what this represents in in a wider sense, I think if you look at something as simple as a four digit lock, uh, a multi combination lock that has ten thousand different combinations. And then I don't know if you've heard the analogy of where you get a chessboard and you put a single grain of rice in the first corner and you keep doubling just to show the idea of compound effect. And it's the it's the ability to tell that. And I think that's where whether you are a good chess player is almost as long as you understand that the fundamental principles of what you're trying to do, the concept of moving various pieces around. And I think that's something you touched upon in the documentary that really struck a chord in what I do as a, as a podcaster because I'm picking up people's life journeys in different places and they're usually able to articulate a number of pieces and moves if you like that they've made uh, across their board through life and actually they're aware of the end game and sometimes the front side backward steps they have to take to get there the sacrifices they have to make to get there and I, I do think there's some grounding in that. I really do, because I think a lot of people, whether it's chess or any other form of strategy game, have perhaps grown up around this kind of concepts that there are games you can play that teach you to think strategically to achieve a long-term outcome. We call it life, but it's gamified, if that makes sense. Oh, it definitely does. Uh, I mean, there, there are lots of really revealing analogies um, and I think at lots of different levels, a primary one is when you've, you've just mentioned, um, 
how do you integrate the different components of your life in a particular way? How do you synthesize the strengths? How do you minimize your weaknesses? How do you recognize the, the struggles that you're up against and yet at the same time can circumvent them? Um, and how do you coordinate in the long term so that you can, you can be successful? Um, well, and as you alluded to, one of the things I mean, when you do something like this, you, you, you think long and hard, well, okay, there are lots of games, there are lots of sports, there are lots of game sports, we can draw the line wherever we want. What makes chess special? What makes chess chess? What makes it different from um, not only, you know, reversi or, or backgammon or something like that, but also games that are also strategy games that can be very, very complicated, like Go, for example. I mean, Go, uh, as I pointed out, has a longer history than chess. It has more possibilities than chess in terms of complexity. Um, it's also based upon ancient military strategy, at least historically. That's how it how it evolved and so forth. So if you want to say, well, okay, but so is there any difference between these things? And the answer is yes, there is a difference. Um, and I'm not saying it's better or worse, but there's a difference. And the difference is that in chess and in any chess-like game, you have different pieces that have different functions that, that have to be coordinated. That's a whole different level of complexity. And not only are there obvious parallels to, to life, uh, very much as you've alluded to, but this also makes chess so remarkably uh, uh, useful and, and so, so often used in, um, in, in allegorical representation. So for example, this idea of uh, of political allegories. So we're all familiar with the idea of, well, you know, the master politician or, or maybe even the evil despot is this great chess player, right? Using people as chess pieces. And that's certainly something that is out there in the public consciousness. But at the same time, many great thinkers over a very long period of time have said, actually, that's completely wrong. That's not the way we should look at things. We have to recognize that no, even if you're a pawn, whether you're a, a small piece, you're still a piece. You still have desires. You still have beliefs. You still have orientation. It is not the right way to go about doing things, building society, running society, pretending that the people who are in your realm are these uh, inanimate objects that you could just manipulate at will. In fact, you have to recognize the fact that that the intentions and beliefs and desires of everybody uh, in society uh, exist. They may be different. They may they may interact differently. They will in interact differently. But that's the way we should actually move forwards. And so, one of the things that I think is interesting from a cultural perspective is that a lot of people have pushed back. I mean, and, and these are very. I highlight people who were particularly influential and accomplished people like Adam Smith, people like George Eliot. They've pointed out that's the completely wrong way to look at it as a master chess player. What you have to do is you have to recognize the utility of all sorts of people uh, working together. And in fact, the goal should be to have a harmonious society where there's integration and synergy across the board rather than some top down a king or despot or what have you who was orchestrating things. And so I think chess has, through this idea of individuation of the pieces, it has, I think, helped. I don't know if that itself has broadened the minds of people as if they wouldn't have come up with these ideas ahead of time. I think that's perhaps a little far-fetched, but it's certainly been a wonderful tool that people have been able to use to express these ideas that are really quite different from the way that a lot of people had thought about them in the past. So touching on the point there, I guess, of alternative viewpoints and thinking differently, when you're researching and putting together a program, you're obviously going to get a lot of noise, especially in the modern day and age where there's more information probably available than there's ever been from a research point of view. So how do you, how do you cut through that and ensure that as a storyteller, what you present is a fair and balanced and authentic story? Um. I think just, I'm not a journalist. Uh, I don't even like a lot of journalists, but, uh, uh, but, I, but a journalistic analogy, I think just comes to mind, which is check your sources. If you, if you find something that you think, oh, this is interesting. And then you, you realize that 
that one source is the only that that's the only representative of that particular viewpoint, then chances are you're barking up the wrong tree somewhere. Um, so the combination of really seeing if this is actually a pattern uh, or or not, and also going right to the primary sources. Uh, I mean, this maybe it's just me. I don't know, but. The number of times I've tried to go to somebody who's explaining a particular concept to me and I couldn't understand any of it. They say, oh, this is what this person said, or that's what that person said. Or, or th there's an example that happened in this, uh, in this chess film. There was a, I, I, I came to learn that there was a famous linguist called uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, a Swiss linguist, and he used a chess metaphor chess analogy, in fact, a couple of times in, in his founding work, which was his posthumously uh, published uh, lectures on linguistics, linguistics course. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. I'll learn. I knew nothing, like zero about that. So I thought, okay, fine, I'll learn about that. So I, I, I went to, you know, went to the internet, obviously went to the internet. It's a pretty old fashioned. I went fishing. Anyway, I, I, I went online and I, I tried to understand um, what was what was going on? And I and I was reading all these secondary accounts. I couldn't understand what the hell they were talking about. I just had no idea. I read them. I reread them. I read, you know, um, there was some stuff in French. There was some stuff in you know English. There was some stuff. I can't, it made no sense to me. Zero. And so then, but again, because of the of the of the world in which we live now, it's just incredibly easy to say, okay, well, I'll just get this source for free. Like I'll go to the actual, so there's a PDF you can find, you know, download it. And I read the, the read the guy's work and it's crystal clear. If you, if, you, if you go to the primary source, it turns out to be incredibly easy to understand what he's saying. It's not hard at all. Um, and so that's, I think another advantage is, is sure, get a sense and go to secondary sources and so forth. But all too often, if you just go to primary sources and you read them, the same with, I mentioned George Eliot and you, you get, get Felix Holt and you'll, it's not hard. I mean, she's writing for you. She's, she, she, she knows what she's doing. It's not difficult to understand what's actually happening. So. Uh, I guess look for a whole bunch of things. Use harness the value of the internet, which everybody, of course, does, uh, or, or maybe they don't do, but they they certainly could do. Um, and also, don't don't be afraid to go to the primary sources because the primary sources are there, and and often they're really easy to understand uh, if if you take the time to go through them. But the secondary sources or tertiary sources, they can be just a nightmare. I mean, often I just don't know what the heck people are talking about. I found that when I did my master's research and looking at, I was going back, you know, maybe I was doing life stories for, for mine. And so obviously you're tracking back for some people 40 or 50, 60 years. And right. some of the, the records are either secondhand or third hand, or I've heard a person say this about this, which they then said about this. And before you know it, you're, you're getting such a warped view of it. Um, there's something uh, before we, we, we get out of the chess stuff, the notion of playing chess and again, you've explored play in in the film, and I look at it and I think there's again a, a much bigger concepts that people can relate to there because I think the notion of what is play, why do we play, how do we play, all of these sorts of things, and obviously in in the context of chess, we go into it in detail. And I think, but how has that learning process of what play is impacted you because I think everyone has their own viewpoints and analogies when it comes to this is my viewpoint on what play is but going through the process of doing this specifically for chess did that change at all or what did you learn from that experience that could have been one of certainly it was one of the biggest things it, it was it was the thing that I started thinking more and more about as I was doing it yeah, yeah. because again um so it's about chess, of course. I mean, it's four hours of film about <laughs> about chess, but it's not about chess at the same time because it's not, you know, this is for chess players or if you're really interested in chess, it's the, it, it, hopefully chess players would, would find many things interesting and contextual and so forth. But the bigger question is exactly what you've raised. And that's why I, in fact, start the whole project that way and and really start thinking, okay, what is this thing called playing? People have talked about it for a very long time. Why do we play? And in fact, not only that, we're not the only ones who play as, as anybody 
certainly in your country knows one of the greatest things about the United Kingdom, of course, is uh, is the respect that is given to non-human forms of life. And and I certainly don't have to tell uh, people there about the 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 notion of of animals playing i mean we all know or people anywhere for that matter i mean we all know that animals play that we're not the only ones members of the animal kingdom who play and so you start asking well what's going on why do why do we do that what is that um why is that satisfying to us are we doing it enough and this led me to really the 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 work of a great uh Dutch cultural historian, Johan Hausenha, who wrote a, a very famous book called Homo Ludens, which is all about the notion of play and to what extent it's related to or relevant to the production of culture. And in fact, his view, which is a pretty extreme view in my mind, but anyway, his view is that everything to do with human culture actually developed from the play instinct, that the play instinct is preeminent. It's what we all have before and everything that that somehow developed, you know, rituals, uh, organizational structure, what have you, is a manifestation of the play. It's, okay, so this all sounds very academic. Um, that's interesting, but 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 I think on a on a on a sort of a personal level, everybody's wondered about this, right? Everybody's thought, well, why is it that I like to play? And then in one of the essays in the, in the accompanying book that I wrote, there's this notion of a waste of time. Well, that's sort of interesting too, because are we wasting our time when we're playing? What does it even mean to be wasting your time? What 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 are we actually trying to do? How does where do we get our enjoyment from? What what are we doing? Um, and then if you look at it in terms of creative areas, I mean, most people who are really creative and produce wonderful works of art, that or wonderful works of science, or wonderful works of what have you, at some level they're playing, or they're often playing originally when they're doing something. So. That question about the value of play and to what extent where uh, uh, it's um, it's part of us and why it's part of us and what it means is very very intriguing and that's something that I've thought I thought I guess a little bit about before but I've thought increasingly of throughout and then there's the whole idea of to what extent that playfulness or play instinct is preserved when you enter a sporting culture right so. So it's almost the difference between play and games. Oh well, he's just playing, but now it's serious. Now we're now we're doing something that's that's sporting, and we're not supposed to be so much having fun anymore. Or yeah, yeah, we can sort of have fun, but we're not really having fun because now we're in an official context. Now we're in a sporting context. Now we're doing something else. Um, and so there are really interesting lines between competitiveness on the good side, competitiveness on the bad side, as I would call it, and the notion of play. And I think. You can get at this through all sorts of different ways, right? I mean, there's nothing specific about chess, I think, that you can do it from all sorts of different angles. But these are fascinating ideas, and they're, I think, particularly relevant for us today because sports and play in that respect is such a an entertainment. It, that's such a major part of our of our society. That's such a driving force in what it is that we're doing. From business analogies when you're using sports to, to teamwork to, to play and all sorts of different components. So I think uh, examining that, looking at to what extent maybe that's changed over the past 50 years or 100 years or 10 years even uh, with the birth of online gaming and so forth and so on. And how that's affecting us. I think these are really, really fascinating issues. And as much as I think chess is a great game, I think they certainly transcend the value of chess per se. And I look at it as an entry point to to a whole host of really fascinating and interesting ideas. It's definitely an area that in my day job in sport, I get asked a lot about by parents working with kind of young up and coming athletes. And you get parents say, well, we've, they're, they're good. They're enjoying it. And they're now on this pathway trajectory, whatever we want to call it. At what point do we need to kind of step it up, you know, take it more seriously. And it's, I find it fascinating because again, I've seen it from the other end. So when you go in and you watch Olympic teams and everyone else training, yes, there is a professionalism to it, but that doesn't mean they're not playing and learning through discovery and having fun while they're doing it. And I think there's this notion that you, if it, if you're playing that it, you can't be taking it seriously. And it's actually like, well, 
if you look at some of the best players out there in any sport, they'll often look like when they're at their absolute best, like they are just playing, like they are having fun. And yeah. I, I do find that a really interesting, it's, it almost feels like a kind of clash of routes where we feel like one route then moves us on to the next and they, they can't possibly coexist next to each other. And again, looking through that, certainly on the the part of the film where you talk about play, I was watching it thinking, this is so translatable to, di and it doesn't matter, it could be sport, it could be anything, but at what point do we stop playing? And, yeah. and that question is a huge one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think related to that, at least related to that in my mind, uh, is the notion of competitiveness. So, uh, we're, we're playing, I mean, there are all sorts of games, there are cooperative games, there are games that are, uh, um, that are extremely competitive and there are games that are not competitive. Um, what what is the value of that? And, and to what extent are we doing something because we just want to win and we are, uh, we're, we're, we want to make ourselves feel good. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that that's really the, the end. A lot of people, when they're talking about playing, I mean, let, let me, let me perhaps try to be a little bit more concrete when it comes to something as sedentary, I guess, as chess, this will offend a lot of people, but anyway, there you go. You can't say anything that won't offend a lot of people. Um, you can compare saying playing, doing puzzles, or at least you can, you can compare solving chess puzzles, even within the paradigm of chess and, and playing. And there are some people who are really interested in the, in the beauty and the artistry or, or puzzling or that sort of thing. And there are people who are j just really primarily motivated in looking at it as a, as a, as a form of combat. You know, your goal is you're trying to, to beat the other guy and you're trying to become the best and so forth. And I think there are lots of things that are interesting about that motif that are also highlighted by examining any one particular activity. And again, it doesn't have to be chess, but it can be, it can be, uh, it can be other things because I think there are very positive aspects of competition and very negative aspects to competition. And for me, what I always think about, because when I was younger, um, I never played chess competitively, but I did play tennis competitively. Um, I was never great, but I did play competitively, which meant that I enabled a lot of people to at least win a round. Um, and, and I used to watch chess a lot. And I think about this a lot because to me, there has been a bit of a switch in the, in the professional game through the efforts of uh, certain individuals. So more specifically, I think of someone like Rafael Nadal. And to me, Rafael Nadal has really defined, re sort of redefined this whole idea of competitiveness, not single-handedly as part of a movement. But when I was younger, the, the people who were playing tennis were people like Jimmy Connors and John McEnroe and these guys. And the, the tacit understanding was, you basically had to be, you, you, I don't know if you had to, but it certainly helped if you hated the guy on the other side of the net. And, and it was all very, very personal. And, and, and Connors is, I think is, is a great representative of this view because he even later on went on to say all sorts of things like, well, the problem with the game today is that, you know, people don't hate each other and, you know, <laughs> this, this kind of stuff. And, and, and when you look to the modern game and you look to someone like Nadal, here is somebody who is, I don't think you could be a more competitive athlete than Rafael Nadal. I, I think it's, it's impossible to imagine somebody being more competitive than this guy. I mean, he gives every molecule of his being to, to winning every single point under every single set of circumstances. Um, and yet... He steps off the court, he's the most decent person imaginable. He's the most grounded person imaginable. He's not the slightest bit petty or vitriolic or plays games or, or you know, gamesmanship or, or any of that sort of thing. So he is, he is an instantiation of this idea, at least to me, that you can be hyper competitive and use competition as a way to excel, use competition as a way to improve yourself, to be able to 
um, uh, to develop to the best of your possible potential without in the slightest way being a so-and-so being uh you know being an unspeakably horrible person or being petty or, or or demeaning your opposition or anybody else um so so these are because you because you see that sort of thing in chess a lot as well right i mean you 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 see it and and i think one of the reasons you see it is because uh because it's not a physical activity and so losing a chess is is as I as I wrote at some point, perhaps one of the worst things psychologically to lose at, because there's just absolutely nobody or nothing you can blame. You can't blame the wind. You can't blame a bad bounce. You can't blame, you know, your teammates. You can't you can't blame anything. Uh, you just have to accept the fact that you've lost, and that that can be very psychologically damaging. On the other hand, it can be very psychologically empowering because it also gives you the opportunity to recognize. Um, that that you will that that you will lose, and of course we all lose if we play anybody who's any good at some point. And the sun rises the next day, and you have to get better, and you have to overcome that. So, uh, so I think this idea of of competition and the good and the bad aspects of competition, and the 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 sort of the good and the bad aspects of the ego uh, aspect, which are so prevalent in all sports, are uh, I think. Chess is is perhaps particularly useful in being able to parse that and examine that and try to get a sense of to what extent can I use this for personal self development and to what extent am I just playing ego games? That's a really interesting point you made there, and it rings true uh, with someone I work with who's an Olympic champion, and when a lot of young athletes ask him in his q a sessions like what's your one thing that you have to get you through the tough times and he says the sun comes up the next day and i i find that really interesting because it does you know you mentioned there around federer and i think it does articulate a point that you can do both um and i think there there is the this dogma almost that you are either committed and extreme at one end or you're just playing and having fun and you can't do both and i think you can, you know, you have exactly. to learn, you know, it takes time. But I think, again, it come back to analogies and that's something that I've seen both in the sporting world and beyond. So I've got a couple of things that I want to touch upon, one chess related and then one a little bit wider around the Ideas Roadshow. The Ideas Roadshow first, having you know done these now and, and looking back and you, you've kind of explored so many different stories, what's been your, whether it's either a golden thread or the one thing that from taking the plunge to where you are now you look back and go that is what's resonated with me the most out of this storytelling experience what would it be i think it's rather than one specific example i think it's the honesty um and obviously you've you've experienced this yourself in many different ways if you give people the opportunity to candidly talk about their work and their ideas, it doesn't matter who they are. I've even talked to, you know, athletes and so forth, not, 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 not nearly as many as you have, but occasionally. So there's not all researchers and academics, although most of them were. People will be very forthcoming about what bothered them, about what or what they what happened serendipitously or what really excited them in a particular way and i don't think we as a general rule we listen to that enough or we give people the opportunity to be able to bring that out we tell we we create these 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 packages oh this person wound up doing something remarkable and so we build these hagiographical hey, you know stories about how wonderful this person was or how he, he or she was destined for greatness or you know this this kind of nonsense um i i think listening to the the real the genuine stories about people's passions their frustrations what drove them completely crazy what they were looking for what they stumbled upon um more of that would uh, that that's what really marked itself to me is that you know there's so many really interesting stories uh that if we were just a little bit more honest and forthcoming and gave people the opportunity to talk about we'd hear more of that 
Well, you're part of that movement already by coming on and sharing your story today. And I've got, I guess, my final question is with the, the chess view on, obviously you dived right into it into such depth. Has, has there been a single thing that's changed massively in your view off the back of it or the impact of that on another aspect of your life now having completed it all and the, the films out there? Well, I guess two things. It's given me the chess community. It's given me a different sense of this idea of community. This I'm, I'm guessing will probably be a surprise to most of your listeners. It was certainly a surprise to me. Um, first of all, the chess community is really large. I mean, chess is booming now big time. And, and because of what we talked about before, because it's global, because it's so internationally recognized, because it has a high degree of status associated with it, and because the barrier to entry is basically nothing. I, I mean, really nothing. If you have an internet connection, you can get on. Uh, not only are some of these platforms very cheap, or basically all of them are very cheap, but some of them are cost absolutely nothing. I mean, WeChess, for example, is completely free and is a fantastic site. And, and the ones that are the corporate sites, they, they cost very little. Um, so the community is just enormous and it's growing. And and I guess the thing, perhaps the thing that's marked upon me is that there's such an odd juxtaposition within the chess community. I've never really experienced anything like it. So on the one hand, there are... <laughs> It can be really insufferable hanging around these chess guys or talking to chess people. I mean, there are real, real issues in a lot of ways. It's incredibly hierarchically oriented. These people, um, they, they're, they're slavishly hierarchical in terms of who they think is the best person. The, 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 there's so much in the online world. I mean, I guess this happens all the time in the online world, but there's a lot of really, really bitter, negative, comments of people. I mean, some of it is just hugely unsavory. There are some very, very serious gender issues in, in the chess world. And that's been the case for a very, very long time with uh, the, the iconic figures of chess, like uh, Bobby Fischer and Gary Kasparov and these people having gone on record and, and basically said downright misogynistic things. Um, there's, a, there's a lot that's really, really unpalatable about that that uh, that community um and there's a lot that's just unbelievably wonderful about that community i mean there's there's a remarkable amount of generosity of spirit there's a remarkable amount of support i i mentioned anecdotally um you know when you're when you're making films you you uh you're looking for b-roll a lot of times you're looking for images that cover things up Every single chess person I asked, I mean, without exception, every single chess person I asked who was involved in, in, um, uh, in somehow the IP or creating um, video or, or resources or something, when I said, would it be okay if I used your material? They said, yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely, great, go ahead. There's a form of solidarity. There's a, there's a, I, I, I mean, I mentioned the, the social empowerment aspect of chess. Uh, which is just unbelievable. I mean, it's just unbelievable what it what it can do. But I didn't talk a lot about the people who are behind that, and those people. I mean, is, they're they're just incredibly altruistic, incredibly dynamic, very generous of spirit. Um, so I've met so many fantastic, forward thinking, passionate, socially concerned individuals in the chess world. Uh, on the one hand, and I've seen evidence of so much unsavoriness. I mean, one, one of the things we haven't talked about is uh, the international sporting body of chess, FIDE, which is a complete and total joke. I mean, it is it is corrupt. It's It's been the plaything of Soviet forces and now Russian forces. It's politicized beyond compare. It's uh, It's completely inefficient. It's uh, it's just a horrible embarrassment to anybody who has any knowledge of of any sense of good governance or or reasonableness, uh, and so you have this on the one hand, and you have these people also shamelessly hijacking this idea of we are one community, and and in a very um, to me very offensive way, 
where they're just being gratuitously self-serving. And it's just, it's just got awful. I mean, anybody with any wit of experience or orientation or perspective or anything, I mean, th these guys make FIFA look reasonable sometimes. I mean, that's how bad they are. Um, and, and so you have that on the one hand, and then you've got this, this unbelievable wonderfulness <laughs> on, the, on the other hand. And it, it's, you know, it could be a bit, uh, difficult to get your bearings. I mean, it's, it's really, it's really a weird, a weird conjunction of these two aspects that I've seen. And I, uh, that's certainly something that, that completely surprised me. I think earlier on, we mentioned around trying to have that balanced viewpoint. And obviously uh, that's rooted in the, the science background. If you like, when you're doing research, you follow the facts and not opinions. And I think it's really interesting there to hear us kind of finish with that because to finish our interview today with actually a very fair and balanced overview being the biggest revelation, actually that, that tells you that you've done an incredible job with your storytelling in, in a very balanced way, because I think it's very easy, certainly in the modern day and age to only tell one side of the story. And I think whatever sport it is, we mentioned uh, one governing body there, but I'm sure there's many global organizations out there that find similar things and yet within the community and on the ground level perhaps there are people doing incredible acts of kindness and and supporting one another so i think there is dark and light in everything that we look at and having been on that journey and shared that story and to represent it like that i think is something to be incredibly proud of so we will obviously make sure that we signpost everyone in the, the notes to what you're up to where they can find the documentary and all the other things you've been up to because i know you've got a, a rich history of production so I just want to say a big thank you because I was really curious as to where this was going to go today. And when I saw, I looked into both your history and then the background of the work that you've done, there was so many threads I wanted to pull on. And I do feel like we've, we've meandered across a range of subjects there today. So just a huge thank you for sharing some time with us, Howard. It's been fantastic. Well, thank you, Kevin. I've had a wonderful time and, uh, and it's been a real, real pleasure. Thank you for, for the opportunity and, and the conversation itself was, was great. I did, I did, it wasn't a terribly balanced conversation. I realized I did almost all the talking. So that's, uh, that's a bit annoying, but, uh, but that's, I think what my job was. So, uh, and you kept asking questions, so I felt compelled to respond. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully in our interviews going forwards, that's how I'll keep it because I think people have heard enough of me babbling on. So yeah, just a huge thank you again. Great. Cheers. A huge thank you for joining us today. You can connect with today's guest and all our Rogue Monkey podcast socials through the links below this episode. If you're involved in a business, we would also love for you to check out our collaboration with Richard Cheatham MBE, our episode 44 guest, the link to which is also in the show notes. Finally, just a quick reminder to subscribe to the podcast, however you're joining us today, and please do pass this episode on to at least one person you think would take inspiration from it. Have a great week, and thanks again for being part of the Rogue Monkey Podcast community.